Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So the obviously you didn't see any grades for the exam, so I haven't graded them. My my goal is Monday. If not, it would be Wednesday at the latest um, to have the exam graded by. Um, so with that, if there's any questions on that, let me know. Um, we're on to the next chapter though, so chapter 12. Okay, I wanna just briefly mention that we had exam one, which was extrogy, which was a lot based on thermo one with the new of extra. So there was a lot linked in exam one. Exam two, which you just did, was all cycles, right? We had power cycles with gas, vapor. We had, um, then we had refrigeration cycles, but they were all, kind of linked, right? You had the um, conservation energies, different components that were similar between them. Um, you know, thermal efficiency was the same for any power engine. Uh, coefficient of performance you've seen before, now you had to apply it for a cycle, right? Um, so, there, I mean, it, not to say it wasn't um, tough chap chapters, but they were linked. So if you weren't strong in one chapter, some of the knowledge from the others helped with, with, with the other chapters. Okay. With exam three, there's there's not as much of that carryover from chapter to chapter. They're more separate. Okay, chapter twelve is our math chapter. You'll see as we go through today, lots of heavy on the math. Um, chapter thirteen is more like a chemistry review. Okay, so that one's not too bad. But fourteen and fifteen, one fourteen's HVAC, fifteen's combustion, more like chemical energy. So there's not as much of a carryover. So 13 helps with 14 and 15, but 12, if you think of 12, is our property relationships, 14 and 15, which is the main thing. So property relationships, HVAC, combustion, or chemical energy. Uh, there's not as much of a link between the chapters. Okay, so that's what, if I look at averages, exam averages overall over the years, I would say exam three is the toughest because of that. Not because it's not because any one chapter's tougher of the problems. It's that you need to be strong on all three chapters because you don't can't use the knowledge of the other chapters to help you with that. So what ends up happening is some students are, you know, strong on two out of the three chapters and it's a different chapter for different students. Because maybe you decide to, you know, miss a class or not do as much work for that chapter or maybe you need more help with a certain chapter but you don't you know go out and reach out and try to get that help um, so that's what I've seen not that anyone has said you know overall that I see someone you know all the class not liking a chapter it's usually one student doesn't like this one one this one this one so it's chapter exam three because of that link that that they're not as linked and because now everything starts being due in my class and other classes, you might have projects and things. So you start missing classes, okay? Or, you know, putting stuff off in one class to do the other. So that can hurt your performance on exam three, okay? Not to say I haven't had good exam three grades, right? It's just more just kind of general generality looking at it. Okay. All right. So with chapter 12, like I said, it's our highly math. Um, chapter okay so be be ready for a lot of a lot of math that we have within this chapter okay it's our partial differential equations chapter so we're going to deal with thermodynamic property relationships so the big thing in this one is where does those tables come from in the back of your book those magic tables that we've been going to okay really it comes from the knowledge of chapter 12 so let's say you work for a company that developed a new refrigerant, you need to populate the tables okay? uh, and create property data. How do you put in property data for entropy right, of water? Right? He's not measuring entropy. So what are you using to get that value? That's where chapter 12 comes in. Um, so you have a new refrigerant or in my research, or my research area, there's fuels. Well, fuels, if you need property data for fuels, there isn't tables and tables of data for fuels. 
or it's a mixture of different hydrocarbons or that. So there's limited property data. So you have to now use equations to get your other data that you might need for properties. Okay, so that's where chapter 12 comes in within my research, and I'm sure it's similar within other areas too. Okay, so first off, we're going to start, we're going to kind of look at, um, we're, so we're going to be able to develop uh, properties with measurable properties. Okay, so we can measure pressure. We can measure specific volume. We can measure temperature. So those are great properties because we can measure those, create a test apparatus. But then how do we get enthalpy, right? And well, guess what? We can use the Clapeyron equation that we will develop. Okay, how do we get the change in internal energy? How do we get enthalpy? How do we get entropy? Well, we're going to develop relationships of how we can get that data off of all these measurable quantities. Okay. We also look at Maxwell equations. Those are pretty popular if you just Google search Maxwell relationships, you'll see tons of things about it, right? Well, we're going to show how that, where they come from. And then the Joule-Thompson coefficient, we're going to look at that. That talks basically about the expansion valve, like if we have a good refrigerant or not for an expansion valve. And then the last one we're not going to get to, okay? So this exception's uh, not covered. Just more re real gases for delta U, delta H, and delta S. So that deals with compressibility. All right. So starting off, well, looping back, we have the state postulate. Right? We defined this way back. I don't know, chapter one, chapter two. That's where um, any two independent intensive property fixes our state. Right. So what that means in mathematical sense, if we had temperature and specific volume, that would give us internal energy, right? We could go and get any other property. So if we wanted internal energy and we knew temperature and specific volume, we can get it, okay? It defines our system, okay? We have tables that it is, but now we're going to look at it more as equations in this chapter. We don't have tables for it. Now we have temperature and specific volume, and we know that should fix our state. So what's an equation we can use to actually get that internal energy value, okay? All right, so a derivative, right, is just kind of the slope at a single point. So if we have that point, the derivative is the slope at that point, right? So if we wanted to look at that, this change in S right here, over the change in X right here, right? So we have that change in F at those two locations, okay? And that delta X, okay? Um, so if we take the limit goes to zero, we have this, right? But we have a numerical method of getting it also. So if we now have an example of this, let's take CP, right? CP, formal definition way back in chapter um, four look like this. It's the partial of enthalpy with respect to temperature keeping pressure constant. That is what CP is. Right? If we have an ideal gas, Joule proved that it's only a function of temperature. So it's not a function of anything else other than temperature. Okay, so we don't have to worry about keeping pressure constant for an ideal gas. It just becomes this, which we've used, right? Where we have dH, Cp, dT, and that's what we use for constant specific heats for an ideal gas, right? Well, what if we didn't have Cp tables, right? Then we could get CP by knowing change in enthalpy, change in temperature. And that's what this example is. Let's get the CP at 300 degrees Kelvin just using enthalpy and temperature data. Okay. All right. So then we have dH over dT. So we numerically approximate it, just a change in enthalpy, change in temperature at 300 Kelvin. Okay. So we go a little bit above 300, so we have 300 plus 5, we have 300 
minus 5. Why did they choose 5? That's because we have data at those rows for that. Okay, so they chose 5 because they didn't want to choose, say, 299 and 298 because we don't have row of data there. We don't have a data for that specific value. So they basically chose the row when you have data above and below that point. So they chose, you know, plus or minus 5. So there's data every 5 degrees. So they went 305, 295. Okay, got the enthalpy at 295, the enthalpy at 305. We get those values for enthalpy from the table. We temperature, we get a CP of 1.005, which happens to be exactly what's in the table in the back, right? Professor, is this somewhat more like interpolating? Um, it's not exactly interpolating because we're not interpolating in the table for, we're not, using the CP table and interpolating, right? Because there is a CP table and we can just get CP at 301, right? We're instead using other property data to get CP, right? Got it, thank you. Yep. So that's with a single, you know, derivative where it's just a function of X, right? Now we're gonna take partial derivatives, okay? And now you have something that's a function of two things, right? So now you have Z, like we said, internal energy, the function of temperature and specific volume. So if Z, instead of looking at it as internal energy, which we'll get to in the later slide, we're gonna say it's a function of X and Y to keep it general, right? Because then we could have entropy, any property, enthalpy is a function of temperature and specific volume, but we're keeping it general for now, okay? So Z is a function of X and Y. If we want to take, you know, Z change just with respect to X, we take the partial, right? We take partial Z with respect to X and we keep Y constant, okay? And then we can do the other part for Y. But if we want to just take one partial, so in this case, Z, we're taking the partial of Z with respect to X, keeping Y constant, right? Okay, so y is being held constant, right? We're just at location y, but we're changing x, because x goes to x plus delta x, and then this is x, so there's this change, right? And then as we take the limit, as x goes to zero, we get our partial here, okay? Some comments on the um, symbols, okay? This and this are differentials, okay? But this, D, represents the total differential change, okay? Where this one represents just the partial, okay? And that's why when I use this relationship here, we went from partial to total because only a function of temperature, not a function of pressure anymore for an ideal gas. Okay. All right, so let's think about now, this is the partial, so how we get a partial, okay? Now let's look at the total differential change. So we want, again, Z, the function of X and Y, okay? All right, we could have, again, internal energy, temperature and specific volume, right? But we're looking at the, so the total change of Z, uh, as we change that X and Y, so we have X being changed from delta, Y being changed from delta from that location Z. So that would be our total change in Z, if we put that together. Well now, let's, let's do some math magic, right? So first step right here is we add and subtract the same thing. So if we put these together, it would be zero, but we want to keep them, right? Because this term, it's at x plus y plus zero, or x, y plus delta y, and here we're at x, y plus delta y. So this is the same term as this. We're just adding and subtracting it to help us with the next step, okay? So we leave that. So this section and this section go together. So we have that down here, okay? So we have that first one here, and that second part here, okay? The other thing we do is we put in these, 
things that are just ones, right? Delta X over delta X is just one. So but we put it in this first term, and delta Y over delta Y, we put in this second term right here, okay? Well, when we do that, we'll see that in this first one section, we have Y being held constant, because we're at Y plus delta Y, Y plus delta Y, so that's the same Y. But we're changing X here. We have x plus delta x and then this is at just x so there's a change in x while keeping y constant right here x is being held constant because the same x but it's y plus delta y and y so we're keeping x constant but changing y here okay well as we make the limits go to zero on the delta y's and delta x's that means we're going to end up with that partial with Z with respect to X, keeping Y constant. Partial Z with respect to Y, keeping X constant. Okay. Okay, so this now would describe the total differential. Okay, so this is the total change in Z from X and Y. Or this could have been the total change, the total change in internal energy, right, with the partial internal energy with respect to temperature keeping specific volume constant, so I'm just doing this example, right? with the change in temperature, and then adding the second term is just partial of U with respect to specific volume, keeping temperature constant, and then this is our delta V. So this is the same thing, just substituting T is X and specific volume is Y, okay? And that would describe how we could get a change in internal energy with changes of these. We don't know what these partials are yet, and we'll get to that, but we at least have some way to describe it as a function of these partials, this total change. Okay. All right, so some other things that we can do, all right, some relationships that help us with this chapter, you know, moving things around, is first off is since properties are continuous point functions and have a exact differentials so maybe in your calculus class um, or partial or differential equations class you looked at testing for exactness right well we can use that to our advantage here okay so we basically just to simplify things we have m and n which it's the same as what we saw in the last slide All right, that's M now, and then we had, I don't know, I just think, I don't want to write all this. Let's go on the last one. To go back here, this is M now, and this is N. They're just substituting and labeling it M and N. So what we do then with this M is now we take the partial with respect to y, keeping x constant. Okay? And then on n, we take the partial with respect to x, keeping y constant. And that gets us, if we look back on what it was originally, that gets us this, right? And it's still z here, z here, just the order in which you took the partials has changed. Okay? And since it's a continuous point function and has exact differentials, the order does not matter. Okay, the order that it's, it's y and then x, and or here x and then y, the order doesn't matter, and we can set those equal. Okay, we can set this equal to this, and that's what you get down here. Okay, and we'll see that in the next slide. That's where the Maxwell relationships come from, or next section in the slides. Okay, but that's what this is. Okay, it allows us to relate one set of partials to another. Okay. Some other things, this is more for manipulating some equations, is the reciprocity relation and the cyclic relation, okay? This is just, if we take x with respect to z, keeping y constant, that's the same as taking one over the partial of z with respect to x, keeping y constant. So here's an example of this, the reciprocity is here. If we have this function, right there, all right, so first off, we're going to take and move it around so we have z on the left, 
okay, and then all the rest of this stuff on the right side of the equation. So we get this. So now if we take the partial of z with respect to x keeping y constant, okay, so y is the, the constant, so that means all this is a constant, all right? So we're only looking at that change in x. So then that's all we're going to be left with is then the constant, because all we have is x that we're taking the partial of. Okay, so then we're just left with the constant left. So that's what we have. Now we're looking for reciprocity. So we want to do, you know, we want to flip this. So we want to do now the partial of z, with res or partial of x with respect to z. Okay, so we rearrange this equation right here for x. So we put x on the left and all the rest on the right of the equation. And we get this. So this is what that function looks like with just x on the left. Now we take the partial of x with respect to z, keeping y constant. Okay, so y is constant, so that means this, that's all a constant right there. Okay, so if we take that partial, we're going to end up with this that kind of gets rid of the z and z here, right? We're just left with this. Well, look at that. It looks like it's 1 over, right? Two, two, over, 2 times y over 3y squared minus 1, 3y squared minus 1 over 2 times y. So it's the inverse, right? So reciprocity holds, right, for these continuous point functions with uh, exact differentials. The other one that plays is also the cyclic relationship. So the partial of x, y, z, when you take x with y, y with z, and z with x, and keeping these constant for those, and just all and multiply it all together, you get negative one. So you can use that to move partials around too. Here's an example. If we now take that idea that we had in the last one, do this cyclical relationship, but we're going to use the ideal gas law. Okay. So we have PV equals RT. Okay. So we set it up where pressure is x, right? And we have y and z. So pressure is x, v is y, t is z on those last those equations from the last slide, and just substitute it all in for there. Okay. So then that means we need to get this partial, this partial, and then this partial, right? Well, first off, start with rearranging for the first one. We need it as a function of pressure, so we have RT over P. And then we're keeping, which you see right here, we're keeping temperature constant and we're taking the partial with respect, oops, went too fast, RT over V. All right, keeping temperature constant, taking the partial with volume. Well, this means the whole numerator is constant, gas constant is constant, and we're keeping temperature constant in this one. So it's like an equation that more looks like this, right? So now we take that partial and then substitute back in the constant, and we'll get this right here. Okay. If we do this for specific volume, right? So volume is RT over P. We want to take the partial V with respect to temperature, keeping pressure constant. Okay, so that means that all is a constant. Okay, we take the partial, and we're just going to be, with respect to temperature, we're going to just be left with the constant, right? Substitute the constant back in, and this version is R over P. Last, we have is temperature. So temperature from the ideal gas law is PV over R. What's constant? Volume, right? So specific volume in our gas constant is constant. So we just have... P in this version, where C is V over R. So we take that partial with respect to pressure, and again, we're going to just be left with the constant. Okay, so it's V over R in this version. All right, substitute them in. We substitute it in now. So we have the first one, second one, third one, and simplify, right? R cancels here. Uh, the square root of specific volume cancels, gets rid of that. 
and we're left with RT over P times V, and that's negative, right? Well, RT over P is equal because if you think of the ideal gas law, it's PV over RT. So I, we could just substitute in on the top PV there, and you see that's just negative. You're going to end with PV over PV or negative PV over PV, which is negative one. <clears throat> Cyclic relationship, or we, we already did the reciprocity. Here's an example. We did this one already here. Here's another example, but with ideal gas law. Okay, so partial V with respect to T, keeping pressure constant, or, you know, rearrange, switching this. And that's what you did here. Temperature with respect to volume, keeping pressure constant. So this one we already did on the last slide is R over P. And if you do this one, you're going to get P over R and 1 over. So it's R over P is equal to R over P, right? So the proof is complete there for that one. All right, so the Maxwell relationships. <clears throat> the Maxwell relationships come from the four Gibbs equations, okay? All right, and we used extensively, uh, you may not remember it, but we used these two, they were the TDS equations, okay, to get all the change in entropy equations in chapter um, seven, okay? So if we, you know, basically rearrange this equation for DS to just solve for the change in entropy on the left and everything else is on the right, that's what we use to get for an ideal gas, the change in entropy for an incompressible substance, the change in entropy, those equations that are on your equation sheet, that's what was done using those two equations, okay? Well, so we're gonna keep those two equations, okay? We're gonna add two more, okay? First off, the Helmholtz function and the Gibbs function, which we haven't defined yet, those are more in um, chemical reactions, okay, that we'll get to. But all we need to know is that that they exist in, um, in their form for this chapter, okay? So if we take the differential of the Helmholtz, we get cha A, just ch change in the Helmholtz, U is change in internal energy, and then here we gotta do PDS minus SDT for this change, okay? And how we get from this version to the version over here is basically getting rid of U DU minus TDS. Well, we can just move this equation over right here, and that gives us DU equal or DU minus TDS is equal to oops, negative PV, right? Right. So I'm just moving that equation around, and then I'm just going to, for du minus TDS, I'm just going to substitute in, oh, sorry, this should be minus P, dv, okay. So du minus TS, I'm just going to substitute in P, dv for this term, because we can get it from this one. And that's what you see here. So we have this S minus DS right here, and this minus PV was substituted in from here from using this first TDS equation. We can do the similar process for the Gibbs function. So change in Gibbs, DG, change in enthalpy, DH, and then we have TS, so it's TDS, SDT. Okay, so again, get rid of these two terms, DH minus TDS, we can use these two. So just moving this over to the other side of the equation, and we're left with VDP, okay? So that's what's being substituted. And we still have the SDT, okay? All right, so we have one gives the equation, two now, and then we have three and four over here. Three and four, okay? Well, 
Those are our four Gibbs equations. Well, we can use them, again, because we're continuous, function, continuous point functions. So if we just test for exactness, so do the process I showed right here, right here, on those equations. So it's from equation that looks like this, and we do this, we can set them equal, right? Well, we do that to those four equations, this one, this one, this one, and this one. You know, basically we just do this, and we test our exactness, set it equal, basically setting them equal. And we, for this equation, we do that, we get this one. Okay, for this one, we get this one. From this one, we get this equation. And this one, we get this one. Okay, so what's the importance of this? Well, look at some of these equations. Let's take this one, for example. This one, we have something with entropy, a partial, equal to the change in pressure with respect to temperature keep and volume constant. Well, all these are measurable quantities. We can measure pressure. We can measure temperature. We can measure specific volumes. It's just uh, mass over volume, or sorry, volume over mass. So we can measure specific volume. This entropy we can't directly measure. But if we find this partial, we can replace it with this one. Same with, let's say, this one over here. These are all measurable quantities. So if we see this partial in an equation, we can replace it with this one, okay? So we have this way to manipulate what equations we have with something that's a better equation to use, okay? All right, so here, it's summarizing again those equations. It's just one, two, three, four with the four Maxwell relationships, okay? And we'll use these in the later slides a bunch, okay? All right, verification. So first off, let's see even just with values we have in the back of our book and our tables, let's just show that one of those partials is equal to the other one. Okay, so if we just take the last Maxwell equation, so that's this one right here, okay, and we're just going to use property data to show this partial is equal to this partial. Okay. All right, so we have the partial with S with respect to pressure keeping volume or keeping temperature constant. The partial with volume with respect to temperature keeping pressure constant, with a negative in front of it. Okay, so we're going to pick 250 Celsius at 300 Kelvin. So that's our state. Okay, so state one, which is the only state we have for this problem. It's temperature, it's 250 degrees Celsius, pressure, 300 Kelvin, there's 300 kPa, sorry, and it's superheated. Okay. To be independent intensive properties for temperature and pressure. All right, so we know our temperature, we know our pressure that we're taking this at. That means this temperature is 250, this pressure is 300. Now we have to get values for, we're going to numerically approximate ds, so that's ds here, dp, dp, dv, dv, dt, dt. Okay. All right, so now we need to numerically approximate these values and get them from the table, okay? So let's start off with, if we have a change in pressure in the denominator, so we're at 300 kPa, right? So we want to take something above and below. So we take 400 and 200, so it's 100 plus, plus 100 kPa minus 100 kPa, because we have property data for that okay, in the back of our book. And then at 400 and 250 degrees Celsius, what's the entropy? At 200 kPa and 250 degrees Celsius, what's that entropy? Okay, we get that here. We go and grab that from the table and we have that value. Now we do the similar process for the temperature side. We're at 300 kPa and we go above and below 250 C. So we go to 200 or 300 and 200. And then we grab specific volume at 200 C and 300 kPa, 300 C, in 300 kPa. We get those from the table. Now we we put this in our calculator, make some noise like boop, 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 and we get the left side equal to this, right, and the right side equal to that, okay? Well, that's only, what, about six out of 160, let's say, because I'm just taking the errors about six difference between them, and it's about a one, 
160, right? So that is, you know, a pretty good value on air, right? So that's pretty good. And that's because there's a difference in this, this air because we're numerically approximating the partials, right? So um, you can expect a little bit of air, but it's still showing that the equations are valid. Um, I'm kind of confused on the S, like why did you do S400 pressure? Is it because pressure, we want to cancel out pressure? No, well, because we need a change. We need, a, we need delta S, right? So we're taking above, we need to be at 300, we're looking at the point above 300, right? So we basically take a point here and here, right? If we're looking for the slope at this value, we're taking across that. Does that make sense now? Um, I'm just more confused because like temperature is constant. Before we were looking at um, like entropy or enthalpy as a function of temperature. So why oh, do we but do we're, here we're not we're not an ideal gas. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it is just uh, steam, which is we have property tables. So that now you need two independent intensive properties to fix your state. In this case. So pressure and temperature. Okay. We were an ideal gas allows it only to be a function of temperature, but in this case we're not. Okay. Okay. So next off, we're going to develop a few equations off of these partials that we have from the Maxwell relations. A couple equations, but so we're going to take this one and use what it's telling us okay, for a specific for a specific process. So that's the third Maxwell equation that I just boxed. Okay. Now we're going to take just during a phase change. Okay. So just the phase change. During a phase change, if we're going, you know, at this case from two to four right here. Okay, so that's the phase change. Well, temperature and pressure being held constant. Okay, so that means the left side of this equation is just a constant. Okay, so it comes from the saturation curve. So it, this is at 100 degrees Celsius. We would have this point right here is our value for our constant. Okay, because that's 100, and that would be our pressure comes with it so we'd have this point for that slope for dp dt and it's a constant okay it's a value at that location okay all right so that means this whole left side of the equation is a constant okay and we call that dp dt so then this ds over dv we just numerically approximate it okay so this part's the constant so then this one we just take this delta s delta V, okay, along the phase change. So from two in this diagram to four right here. Okay, and that is from a saturated liquid to a saturated vapor. Okay, so the delta S, saturated, we're basically just then, that becomes SF, or sorry, SG, minus SF over VG minus VF, okay. If we move these around, that's what you see here. So this is on the left side of the equation now, because we multiplied it times our constant, which is just dp dt. Okay, so we moved it over. Okay. So now we have delta s, we have delta v. Now we if we put it back, I guess, this is just then SF over S G V F G. Okay is this numerator, this denominator, which is all equal to that constant. Okay, so we see this. All right, so we're looking in the Clapeyron equation, we're looking to get something for enthalpy. So we gotta bring in one of those TDS equations we had earlier. So this is a TDS equation. 
that the process follows. So we're we're taking this one, okay? And we're taking our process. Well, our process, temperature is being maintained constant during this phase change process, but also pressure is being maintained constant because this is a constant pressure line, okay? So pressure is constant, so that means along this process, that term goes to zero for this process. So we just have then that the change in enthalpy is TDS for this process, for this phase change process. So if we integrate across our phase change from this state to this state, we have the change in enthalpy across that, and then we have temperature times the change in entropy. Well, that's just HFG and SFG, because we're just doing across SF to F, SG and HF to HG. Okay, so we have related this way. So we can then solve for SFG and put, since SFG is HFG divided by T, so we can then just put that in for SFG in this equation and we get our Clapeyron equation. Okay, so within these derivations, oh, sorry, I didn't see the question I just got, um, but before I answer the question, before we get to the, um, you know, within these derivations, it's really important for you guys to kind of understand where we started and kind of ended, because there's a bunch of derivations in this in this chapter. I don't necessarily expect you to know every single step of the derivation, uh, but kind of the beginning to end, like the, the where we start, where do we end up, okay. Um, Yes, so yes, so the question was, and I'm sure if you guys have your chat open, so back, do you choose arbitrary values, equidistance from your values that have table values? Yes, so you want table values that are, you have numbers in your table for. So basically, because you want, when you're picking back here, when you want the slope at this point, you know, you really want something as close to that point as you can get that you have good values for, okay? So that's why you basically, go as far as then when you have table values. Because any point in between those, those are interpolation values. So they're not really good values, okay? So you just take the rows that you have, you know, data for, okay? So just go above them, you know, you go plus and minus to the point where you have table values, okay? Because if you go too far, right, go too many rows above and below the table values you have, so you go beyond, now you could be approximated this slope with values somewhere too far away from it. So it could be a bad point to take as your approximation. Let's say we have a curve like this and you take a point from here to here and you know, you're trying to approximate this slope, you're gonna get more like this. But if you take row values you have data for that are closer, you know, as close as you have, now you get a better approximation for that, that slope, that, that derivative. Right? So the Clapeyron equation, so we derive that, right? We're gonna make a little, so that's it here, so calling it out, right? We have our nice salmon color equations showing us what's important, right? Um, so this is a constant, and then we have our latent heat of vaporization, just equal to temperature and specific volume, okay? So a good relationship, so this is measurable, temperature is measurable, and this is measurable. So enthalpy is, is not, but we could use this equation to get it, okay? All right, so we're gonna add to that equation. So take it one step further for to develop the clapeyron clausius equation, okay? In this version, we basically simplify VFG to VG, okay? And that's because at low pressures, VG, is much greater than VF. Like if you look in your table values, for water refrigerant, because you know a liquid is very dense, and this is the inverse of density. So you're gonna have a very small specific volume for a liquid, right? So the gas then has a large specific volume, much larger, okay? So it could be orders of magnitude larger. So we're just gonna say, okay, and approximate it. That VFG from our Clapeyron equation right here, we're gonna just say, that's VG. 
So that's an assumption that we're making, right? Right here. So we're simplifying with this assumption. The next one for the Clapham Clausius is we're going to say it behaves as an ideal gas because we just have VG. So we're going to assume ideal gas. So we use the ideal gas law, right? So if PV equals RP, so for VG, we put in the ideal gas law. Now, that means we put this in for VFG, right? Since this is equal to this, which is equal to VFG. So we, for this term right here, we put in that ideal gas law, and we get this, okay? Well, what does this allow us to do? Well, we have pressure right here. We have temperature and temperature here. So if we put these terms on the same side, we have dP over P. We have dT over T squared. Well, we can integrate that holding these constant, okay? So we integrate this side and integrate this side over state one to two, okay? So between two saturation states. Professor, well, so this equation essentially is just uh, making the assumption that it's it's just a simplified version for an ideal gas situation, right? Yeah, it's well, it's saying it, it's not necessarily that this is only applied to an ideal gas. It's just saying that VFG of if we were saying if we were going to use this for water, let's say that VFG for water is simplified to an ideal ideal gas. Not saying that HFG because it still has HFG in it, and that's not that's latent heat of vaporization. Okay, so it's just saying that for VFG we're we're going to make it equal to VG and then make that equal to an ideal gas. So just only for that part of it are we saying it behaves for, as an ideal gas. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yep. All right. So if we integrate now, we're going to get this. Okay, and I'll have an example that uses this. Okay, so this is now the Clapeyron Clausius equation. So we have the Clapeyron that helps us get HFG, and then we have the Clapeyron Clausius equation that can help us get pressure changes or temperature changes okay, with HFG. All right, so example. All right, so we have, we want the HFG, in this case, we're just looking for refrigerant 134A, okay? But we want it all based on measurable data, okay? And that's this equation. So we're just rearranging the, Cla the Clapeyron equation right here for HFG, okay? So it just moves it around. We have HFG in the left and all the rest of the terms on the right. And guess what? All those terms are measurable data. We can measure temperature, we can measure specific volume, and this is the saturation curve. We can measure that also, okay? Well, now we just go get table data. We get specific, so we want it at 20 degrees Celsius, okay? So we go and get VG and VF at 20 degrees Celsius, subtract it, and that's VFG, okay? We know temperature, it's already 20 degrees Celsius, but we need to add, you know, plus 273. We need it to be in absolute, right? We need it to be in Kelvin. Okay, so we have 293 Kelvin, right? Then we need, the last thing we need is this, this derivative of the saturation curve at our point. So we're at 20 degrees Celsius. So at 20 degrees Celsius, we go a little bit above and below, okay, to our row data. So our row data for refrigerant happens to be above 20. We, our next one is 24 degrees Celsius. Below 20 is 16, okay? And we get our saturation pressures at those points, okay, because we're at SAT, right? Calculate it out, and this is what that slope looks like, okay, for the saturation curve. Now we have all our values. We plug them back in here, okay? So we have our temperature. We have our VFG. We have our DP, DT on the saturation curve, okay? And we get 182.62. Right. Checking how good that data is, that value we got. Well, if we actually look in our table, because we do have table data for our refrigerant, right? Um, we see in our table in the back of the book, we get 183 or 182.33, right? We had 182.62, so that is, you know, about 0.3 
out of 182, right? That's the error. That's very small, right? That's a pretty accurate mathematical representation, right, with measurable quantities for HFG. All right, we, if we wanted to refrigerate HFG for ours, we just go back in the back of the book and grab it. But this is to show you what you do if you don't have that table data. We have this equation that can get us there. Okay. And really this error is because, again, we're numerically approximating here. Okay. All right, so now we did an example for the Clapeyron equation right here. Let's do an example for the clapeyron clausius equation. Okay. This one's, I think, interesting is because we're going to use it to get the saturation pressure of R134A at negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Well, in the back of the book, we only have negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit data for R134A. It still can go to negative 50. We just don't have the data. So how do we get that? We're going to use this, the clapeyron clausius equation to get there. Okay, so this one right here. Okay. And that's what you see right here. So that means state two, so T2 is going to be negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. T1 is going to be negative 40 okay, degrees Fahrenheit. So we know T1, we know T2, we get HFG, we only have HFG at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, so we grab that one, and that's right here. Okay. okay so we grab that. We know R for refrigerant, we can look that up. And then pressure one is the pressure, the saturation pressure, so P sat at negative 40. So we have that in our back of our book. And that's 7.432. And then, so then the only unknown is the saturation pressure at negative 50, P2. So we put our values in and solve for P2, we get this. We get 5.56 PSIA. Okay. Well, the actual value from another source at negative 50, not our book, is this. So we are about 0 0.06 out of 5.5. So again, pretty accurate right there, about 1% uh, error. If we just did extrapolation, right? We've been doing interpolation, but if we just extrapolate, right? We have property data with these two points, right? Linear interpolation would get us something in between those two points, some row data. So we had negative, if we were, had negative 40 and we had negative 30 and we wanted 30 points, negative 30.6, we could in, interpolate and get something in between. Well, we want negative 50 and we don't have data. So we would use these two points to extrapolate somewhere here, right? And it would be, it would assume it's linear and get us negative 50 value. Well, if we did that, we would get 5.134, which is, you know, about 0.4 out of 5.5 on accuracy. So that's the error. So we get around 7% error using linear extrapolation. That's because it's not linear of a curve, right? We're extrapolating and just assuming it's linear. So we get a better accuracy as we know the path because this says, you see the natural log in there. So we know it's not linear, right? So using this equation, we get a more accurate value, okay? I see this equation in my research. They use this for fuel information. Uh, you know, there's limited data. We don't have tables of fuel data for um, fuels for, set, let's say, fuel injection, where you need to know saturation pressures. While they have limited enthalpy HFG data, you might have it just at one uh, temperature and pressure, right? So you want it for a whole bunch of others. Well, you can use this equation off of that single data point you have to get the other, uh, the other data, the other values. All right, so this is switching to other equations here. Okay, in this version, we're gonna develop general equations, okay, for DU, DH, DS, CV, and CP, okay? 
okay? And this is for two independent intensive properties, right? And they're general equations. We're gonna develop it for anything. We're not gonna use any assumptions of ideal gas, um, incompressible, anything. So it could ev eventually be used for ideal gas, but we're not gonna make that assumption at all to start with. So it can work for any substance, okay? And we're gonna want it to be based upon easily measurable quantities. So pressure, specific volume, temperature, specific heat are all things we can measure, okay? All right, so let's start with internal energy, okay? So way back in the earlier part of the slides, we had this, Z with X and Y as its function. We took the total uh, derivative, and we have this. Well, we're just gonna approximate it as what I had earlier. Internal energy is a function of temperature and specific volume. Again, take the total with the partials now here and here for internal energy. Well, this partial right here is actually just the specific heat at constant volume. That is the definition. So we can replace that partial with that specific heat, right? So we're good there, that's measurable, right? And temperature is measurable. So we're good on this term right here. Now we need to figure out something for this partial. Right, All right. that's a little trickier, okay? This, we're gonna bring in a different equation. We're gonna say, okay, let's take entropy as a function of temperature and specific volume. So the same thing as what we did above with internal energy, temperature, and specific volume. So we're doing the same thing, okay? We'll take the total for entropy, so let's get this, partial of those two variables, and dt, dv, okay? But what we do to get it into the form we want is we take the, one of those TDS equations, the first one that we had earlier on, that's this right here, okay? The TDS equation, the first Gibbs equation, and we just, we have ds right here. So we just, and we have an equation right here that is equal to ds. So we take this whole thing and you cram it right into ds right here, okay? When we do that and put like terms together, we've created this equation right here. Okay. Well, this is du, dt, dv, and it has this term and this term. Well, that's what this is, du, right? It has this term, it has this term. Same with this one, du, and it has the first term, dt, this term, dv. Well, guess what? We can set those equal, okay? So again, we have du, du. DT, DT, DV, DV. Well, we can make, that means this is equal to this, and this is equal to this, okay? All right, so that means this is equal to this is this first one. That doesn't help us in this derivation. It actually helps us in a later one, okay? Because we already have specific heat, so we don't want to change that out. So we already have CV, so we're going to leave that one. But this second one, we need to get to something that's measurable. We can't measure internal energy directly, okay? So we replace it with this, all right? We made more turn, we expanded it to something larger, but eventually we're gonna, in the next step, make it something that's useful, okay? So we have now this partial equal to these two, ter these two things here. Well, guess what? This partial right here with entropy is a Maxwell relationship that we derived earlier. So we can just replace this, with this partial, okay? And we put that in there. Now we can put this whole term in for that du, dv, keeping temperature constant. So now we have the change in internal energy, CV, dt, and this, and this. And guess what? All, everything shown here is measurable. We have specific volume change, we have pressure, Pressure is a function of temperature, specific volume. All measurable quantities, temperature, temperature, specific heat. All measurable quantities. So in general equation, we can use for any substance. We can create data for how that property, how that substance changes with temperature, pressure, and specific volume. If we integrate this equation, we get this, okay? One easy one to see how this applies. It's general, it works for anything. Well, if we did the simplifying assumption for an incompressible substance, 
that takes dv out and that takes this whole term out and you have your equation on the in your slide on your uh, equation sheet if you use the simplifying assumption for an ideal gas well guess what this is going to you got to do the partial here uh, from the ideal gas law substitute it in you're going to see that right hand term go away too because we know an ideal gas is going to look like the left okay or if you want water refrigerants values you now get data for all this and you have something for internal energy for refrigerant or water all right here's an example with we're going to instead of using the ideal gas law we're going to use the van der waals equation of state so it's more accurate than the ideal gas law so we're going to use van der waals equation of state okay we're also instead of just saying cv is one value we're going to say it's a function it's a linear function of temperature where c1 and c2 are just constants okay well we take this general equation we have right here we're going to apply it okay well cv we have our our linear line we can just plug that in and that's what we do right here substitute it in down here but this side we need this partial first so we rearrange van der waals equation for pressure and then take the partial of pressure with respect to temperature keep the volume constant so we get go from this to this when we do the partial okay this is just putting all these terms together of this equation t times that partial and then minus p so if you do that simplify you get just this a over v squared okay now we plug that in all for that term right here and that's what you see down here okay and we plugged in for cv that linear line now we can integrate and we have an equation okay so this is an uh, equation for a gas obeying van der waals equation of states with specific heat with a linear as a function linear function so it's a more accurate version for property data than we even had for just an ideal gas okay how did you get the p equals rt over v minus where was that stated this the one? van der waals equation no the van der waals equation the one under yeah that oh that that is just the van der waals equation of state so in chapter um three no yes yeah chapter three where you do the ideal gas there's van der waals there's some other equations of state that are much more difficult in that one where we had compressibility factor so van der waals is just more accurate than the ideal gas law All right, so we do, we did it for internal energy, this derivation. We're gonna see it's very similar for enthalpy. Uh, we just take enthalpy with temperature and pressure. Okay, a similar method, okay. So we're gonna have, we have Z previously, DZ. We do this for enthalpy, but with temperature and pressure. For internal energy, we did temperature and specific volume. Uh, so DH, we have our partials. So we have dt, dp, and our partials with those. Okay. Well, this first term, just like it was cp for internal energy, it's cp for this enthalpy one. So we have cp, so we're good there. Now we need to do our manipulations to get this one. We're gonna do a similar process. We go to the entropy, again, do the same um, properties, so as a function of temperature and pressure that we did here, but for entropy, okay? So we do that total change in entropy with the partials. So dt, dp, okay? So that's the same dt, dp. But we need to get rid of this ds, right? We want dh there, okay, instead. So we basically cram this whole thing into the ds and the other tds equation, okay? So we just take this whole thing, put in ds, and that means we're gonna be left with something that's dh dp and dt okay and that's what you see down here put it all together from this equation and this and this one okay we get this with dh 
dt dp, which is the same version we want here, dt dp. So that means we have this terms in front, which again is here, right? So then this one is equal to that, and this term is equal to this. Okay, and that's what you see here and here. Okay, again, this first one doesn't help us for this derivation, it helps us for a later one. Second one, it does, because we have this, which this partial right here is again a different Maxwell equation that we can substitute in. Okay, so for this partial, we substitute in the Maxwell equation, this one. Okay, substitute it in, put it back into our original DH equation, and we have a version for change in enthalpy that's all a function of just measurable properties. So we can utilize this, integrate, we get this. We also have from just the definition of enthalpy, U plus PV, we could take this version, DH equals DU plus DP, DV, right? And that's what you see here. That's another version of getting change in enthalpy. All right, entropy changes are a lot quicker, okay? If we S, entropy is a function of temperature and pressure, we get this partial. Well, this one happens to be that thing I was said I was, we were going to use soon is CV over T. Okay, so CV over T for that one. This one is a Maxwell equation, so we just plug it in there. Okay, integrate, we get this. Entropy is a function of temperature and pressure. Okay, the partials. Okay, and then replacing this partial, this happens to come from CP over T from the enthalpy derivation right here. And then another Maxwell equation, substitution. So we get this version. Okay. And guess what? If we put in the ideal gas law and substituted in the ideal gas law and figured out this partial, you'd get the equation on your equation sheet for a change in entropy of an ideal gas. If you did it for this one, for ideal gas, you'd get the other equation for the ideal gas change in entropy. Okay, if we did it for a incompressible substance that takes dV cancels, so this whole right term goes away, and that's the equation you have on your equation sheet for an incompressible substance. So these are general, valid for any substance. Okay. All right, so a couple other things is how to get how to CP and CV change. So just how to look at changes of, of specific heats. Well, we can use from the change in entropy right here of the entropy equation we had on the slide right before. Okay, and we just test. We do our exactness. Okay, so we end up with this. Okay. So that shows us for chain, how does CV change with these changes in properties? Okay. We can do with entropy as a function of temperature and pressure. We can do the other entropy, change in entropy equation, take the exactness, and we get how CP changes. Okay. Um, we can do How, so that's just how CP and CV change. We can also look at it from how does CP minus CV. So we want to get CP minus CV. So we just take these two entropy, change in entropy equations, set them equal because DS and DS. So we just set this term right here equal to this term. If we do that, rearrange, we get this. Okay. Well, if we also know if that's just temperature as a function of V and P, because this is V, this is P, and that's T, well, if we take the total differential for dV, we get this version of it. All that means is this is equal to this, and this is equal to this. Well, we can set this equal to this, we'll get this equation down here, or we can do this one equal to this, we'll still get this equation. Okay. And that tells us how CP minus CV, how much they differ. It's a function of these terms on the right. 
Another version, just using the cyclical relationship we had earlier, manipulating things, we can get this version. Okay. Last slide was this one. We're just moving stuff around to this one. Why do we want this one? And why are they even show, caring about that one? Well, it brings in some other thermodynamic properties of volume, expansivity, and isothermal compressibility. These are defined like this. So if we take those and put them into this equation, we're going to get this smaller equation that looks like this. Okay. What does this tell us? Well, guess what it tells us? That CP is always greater than CD because everything on the right is always a positive value. Okay, we can go back to the equations and look at it. But specific volume, temperature, uh, beat this beta squared because it's squared, right? And then this one always ends up being um, greater than zero. Also. So CP has to be greater than or equal to CV. As temperature goes to absolute zero, the, they're the same, right? CP equals CV. Another thing is, if it's truly incompressible, CP is equal to CV, right? And we can see that with, um, if we take beta, right? It's, there's no change in specific volume as a function of temperature, then this is zero. We have zero here, for, and that's zero squared. We still get zero here for this whole term. It says CP is equal to CV for an incompressible substance. We can, we know, we have an equation, I think it's on the equation sheet, where CP minus CV is equal to R for an ideal gas, right, is equal to the gas constant. Well, we can derive that from our general equations for CP minus CV, and then using the ideal gas law, just get these partials, and that's what's being done here. And then the other partial, okay, here, plug them in and start canceling terms, you get R. Last, last equation, okay, is the Joule-Thompson coefficient, okay? Joule-Thompson coefficient is for a throttling device. So this is our isenthalpic device, okay? The enthalpy is being held constant. Well, if we have a refrigerant, right? We want a, ref we want a refrigerant, right? We drop the pressure through a valve. We want the temperature to also drop because that's important, so then we can get the heat transfer into the, re the refrigerant, right? If it doesn't, it's not a good refrigerant. You shouldn't use it, right? Well, the Joule-Thompson coefficient tells us that, right? If we change pressure, so we drop pressure, what kind of change in temperature will we get when we keep enthalpy constant, right? Well, if the Joule-Thompson coefficient is greater than zero, temperature decreases. If it's equal to zero, it's going to maintain, it's going to be the same from the inlet to the outlet. It's less than zero, temperatures increase. That's not a good refrigerant, right? So if we had this temperature, this inlet state, you know, different versions of the exit state. Right? Here it's showing this dashed line is where that inversion point occurs. So where you're an increase, to decrease, right? Or decrease to increase. So where that switch occurs, that inversion line. It's greater than zero. That's where our temperature is decreasing. Okay, when we drop pressure. So if we started right here in pressure and we dropped pressure, so we'd go this way, we would drop in temperature. So we'd start here, we go here, we drop in temperature. Right? Well, if we got on this side, we'd we were here in pressure, we drop pressure to this point, we would increase in temperature, okay? That would have a Joule-Thompson coefficient less than zero. All right, last thing in, in an example, I'll go through it quickly, is we can derive another version of this Joule-Thompson coefficient equation if we take the general change in enthalpy that we just derived, so this is the change in enthalpy that works for anything, right? Well, if we have an isenthalpic process, this is zero. So 
So for the valve, it's isenthalpic. So this is zero. All right. So now we have, if we do that and rearrange for dt over dp, this, the rest of the terms, we're going to end up with this on the other side and dt over dp on, on the right side in this version. And it's a partial because we made enthalpy stay constant. We set it equal to zero, the dh. So we just derived basically the Joule-Thompson coefficient from the change in general change in enthalpy. And this only depends on CP, volume, temperature, and a partial. So we could use this for any substance. All right, here's an example for ideal gas. All right, we know from just applying the ideal gas conservation energy and the ideal gas law, we know the temperature at the inlet to be equal to the outlet. All right, but we can also derive that just by from our Joule-Thompson coefficient we have right here, this equ equation. So that's the equation right here. So CP, we can get that from the tables, but we need this partial, right? So we take our ideal gas law, set it for volume, specific volume, then take our partial volume with respect to temperature, keep the pressure constant, we get this R over P. So we plug in R over P for that partial, so you see it here. Well, that's TR over P. Well, that's the same thing as specific volume. That's RT over P. So that's specific volume. And this ends up being specific volume because they're equal. So that's specific volume minus specific volume is zero. So our Joule-Thompson coefficient is zero for an ideal gas. Okay. For real gas, it's not. But for an ideal gas, it is. Or even for a um, Van der Waals equation idea of a gas it's going to have a different Joule-Thompson coefficient. Okay, so that's what we did class today. We, a little bit of math, right? Just a little bit, right? The, Joule, the Maxwell equations, Clapeyron equation, and the clapeyron clausius equation. But then we just looked at general equations that work for any substance of in, change in internal energy, enthalpy, entropy, and then how CV and CP change. Okay. and then the Joule Thompson. Okay. That's our chapter. Okay, so in the big things to understand the starting point of the equations and the ending point kind of thing. Okay. Not necessarily looking for you to know every single step from the beginning to the end. Especially for those long derivation ones. So would you say that the Maxwell relations are like the most important equations to remember? Uh, from this chapter? No, I mean if you look, I have the equation sheet on for the next exam already posted, so you can look at what I have there, okay? So those are important. I mean, the other main equations that I had um, set up with, you know, any of those in that pink salmon color or whatever, um, those are important, and then just using them, right? So the examples were just, a lot of them were just taking a partial and then plugging it into those equations, right? So understanding how to do that is kind of a main thing in this chapter, okay? Sounds good. All right. Any other questions? All right, so then I went a little over, but that means we'll just do examples in this chapter, the next class, okay? All right. Have a good one. Yeah, you guys have a good one? See you on Monday. And again, if you have any questions or any concerns, set up a can set up a Zoom meeting.